Today I'm going to speak to you about the most valuable people in the church. The most valuable people in the church. So if I ask you the question, if I were to ask you the question, who do you think the most valuable people are in this church? Who are they? What, what would you think? What would be the most valuable person in your family? Probably we will, get, we will have very answers, different answers. Uh, sometimes we will think of the bread provider as the most important person because it provides the money. Sometimes we will think in terms of the church, the pastor is the most important person. That's why some people would think. Some people would think the choir, the musicians, the singers, they are the most important people in the church. Sometimes we would think the ashes, they are the most important people, the people who prepare the, the hole, the seat, the chairs. Who do you think is the most important person? Some people would think the leaders, we we'll think the elders, the deacons. We will have different answers of who the most, who is the most valuable person in the church. But I've got to to say that the growth, the blessing of a church, the blessing of a family, is not and the person who provide money or the bread or the breadwinner. The strength, the growth, the blessing of a family of a church is in the hands of those who pray for it. In the hands of those who pray for it. The most valuable person in the church, in any family, is the person who pray. And I'll show you why. The direct answer is, in fact, if you think that the breadwinner is the most important person, person, that person cannot wake up every morning, go to work if God did not give him the strength to go to work. Without the breath of, the breath of life, without the strength, without uh, even the provision of a job, you can't provide for your family. So sometimes we think the most important person is the person who, who brings all this, but the most important, the most valuable person is the person who pray. And if um, a man found a wife who prays, he has found a blessing. Oh, I'll say it again. A man who has found a wife who prays, he has found a blessing. Because in those prayers that help the man to be the man. And a man who found a wife who does not pray, he's in trouble. Because who builds the house? Who builds the home? It's not a man. It's a woman who builds a house. That's what the Bible says that a woman who's wise will build the house on a solid foundation. But a woman who is stupid, she will destroy the house. And in fact, men sometimes will remain babies for a long time. Even when you see me a grown-up, I still need to be taken care of. When I get home on a Sunday after church, yes, I can go in the kitchen and make my own things, but I always struggle, struggle about everything. You'll be calling, why are you? Are you still coming? Are you on your way? Because the house is not a house without a wife. It's not a house without a woman. A church is not a church without a woman. But what I'm saying is, a woman can only be as important as the prayer is in her, in her life. And without a prayer, we can't do nothing. The most valuable people in the church is not the pastor. It's not, it's not the singer, it's not the musician. The most important, the most valuable people are the people who pray for the church. These are the most, pe the most valuable people. Look at with me in the book of Exodus chapter 17, 8 to 13. Exodus chapter 17 to 8 to 13. The Bible says, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men 
and go out to fight the Amalekite. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekite as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Ur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under his, you know, under his arms. And he sat on, on it. Aaron and Ur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hand remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. The Bible tells us about this incredible story about Moses and about Joshua. Joshua was general in the army, the chief of staff. He went to the battle according to Moses. Moses asked him to go and fight the Amalekite. The Amalekite, they wanted to defeat the people of Israel. They were fighting against the people of Israel. Joshua was fighting this battle, but he was not winning the battle, and it took a long time. Then the Bible says that Moses, as long as he kept his hands up, the Israelites were winning. But every time he was lowering his hands, they were losing. And this, the, the significance of this is that putting your hands up is you're putting your hands up to God. You are crying out to God. You are praying to God. You are asking God for intervention. You are asking God for strength. You are God asking God for power. You are asking God for victory. And every time Moses was asking and crying out to God, every time he was praying, the Bible says the Israelites were winning. But every time he was not doing so because his hands, his, his hands got tired, the Bible says the Israelites, they were, they were losing the battle. And this is what happened in our lives, in our families, in the church. Every time we raise our hand to God, every time we remain in prayer, every time we pray, our families are winning. Every time we are praying, every time we keep our hands up, our men are winning. Our men are the Joshua's. They are on the ground. They are fighting the battle. You don't know what your man is fighting at, at, at the jobs, at the workplace. You don't know what they go through every single day. But every time you kneel down, every time you raise your hand for your man, for your husband, for your family, something is happening on the ground. Something is happening on the ground. We don't realize it. I see people just being asleep. I see people taking things for granted. You cannot take victory for granted. You cannot take success for granted. You cannot take blessings for granted. You can't take anything for granted. Whatever you have to get, you have to get it on your knees and you have to pray. You have to ask to God. Some of your men will go on and do great things because they have support. That's why it's always said that behind a great man there is a great, a great woman. Behind a great man, there's a great, you know, when most of the time when a man is standing and is talking, we say, man, I don't know, we're not as strong as you think we are. Physically, yes, I can do that DIY. DIY. Work at home, I can fix that bowls. I can carry that heavy stuff. That's all I can do, really. But emotionally, are we as strong as women? Seriously, we're not. So God has given to each and every one something. And are you playing your part? Are you doing what you should be doing? And every time Moses' hands were up, the Israelites were winning. Every time we are crying out to God, every time we are praying to God, every time we are crying out for blessings, for breakthrough, for a touch, something happened. I remember some years ago, there was uh, one of our sisters who testified about a problem that her husband was having at work. At work. Her husband was a medical doctor. And at work, he had a, a husband had a supervisor, someone who was really making his life really, really tough. And the husband would come home every single time and complaining and crying. And the wife, she testified in the church when we were not here, when we were at Frederick Street. And she said, I told my husband, 
Don't worry about this. I will take care of this. And the husband said, how are you going to take care of this? You're not going to come at my work and speak to my boss. And the wife said, don't worry about it. And the wife said, I went into prayer. I fasted and I prayed for three days. And after a week, the husband came to me and said that my boss has been removed from my workplace. It has been affected somewhere else. And the wife said, we've won it. We've won it. Hallelujah. And this is, this is something that we neglect most of the time. We think life is all about, about talking, about doing all the good things, but we, we, re, we don't realize how much prayer is important, whether it is in the church, whether it is in your family, whether it is in your, in your workplace, whatever it is, we don't realize how much prayer is important. And the Bible says, not only Moses was praying, it got to a point where Moses can, could not hold his hands up. He got tired. Do you know that all of us, we get tired? All of us, we get tired. All of us, we need help somewhere. The pastor can pray. It's all good. But there, there will be a time where the pastor can pray and need someone like Aaron. He needs someone like, oh, there, there were two people who stood by Moses' side and they held his hands up. They helped me, they helped him to keep his hands up. The Bible says that they, they supported one on one side and the other one on the other side. They supported and they sustained his hands so that Israelites would keep winning. That tells you one thing. That you and me, we don't have a role to play. We cannot just be looking at Moses and say, Moses, raise your hands. If you're tired, then that's your problem. No, we have to be saying, when your hand is tired, we're going to come and help you. And that is the importance of the church. When people sometimes say, I can pray at home, it's all good. But the problem is, there will be a time where you're going to be tired. So you need a brother, you need a sister, you need someone. You need someone who can help you. You need someone else who can hold your hands up. We are stronger when we support one another. We are in a better place when we support one another. You can't just say, I'm going to win this battle on my own. I don't need anyone in my life. I don't need anything. I don't need a church. I don't need anyone. I will manage myself. The truth is, you are just a human being. You're not a robot. Even a robot, probably he needs electricity. And if he runs out of electricity, he can't even function. We all need strength from somewhere. And for Moses' case, he needed Aaron. He needed Ur. He needed someone else, two people coming to help him. My question to you is, how many people do you really help? How many people do you support in your prayer? How many people do you sustain in prayer? How many times you, you whine in your prayer and you say, I will pray for my husband, I will pray for my children, I will pray for my family, I will pray for my pastor, I will pray for the singers, the musicians, I will pray for all these, uh, all these people. Most of the time we criticize people when they grow weary and tired. But we don't ask ourselves the question, how much have we prayed for them? We criticize what we do, do you know how many times we talk to one another and trying to fix one another? Trying to fix one another. We think we have the power to fix one another. We think that I only need to speak to, to change you, to fix you. But it's more than that. It's more than that. It's more than, it's more than what we can do, that, that we can handle. Sometimes even for our children, we can do some work. But the problem is, we cannot fix our children. And this is the mistake that we have made in these countries where we have said we don't need God. Or we go, we're going to do it by ourselves. We can fix our children only to realize that you can't. You just can't. That's why we need to pray for our children. We need to pray for our children. I remember as I was growing up, before we go to bed, we will gather, we were a big family, then we will, we, we will pray before we go to bed. The problem is I hated it. As a child, I wanted to go to bed. I was tired. And my dad would start praying. The problem is we were 16 children in the house. 10 children from my, my dad and mom, 
and 16 other children, you know, you know, uh, six other children from my dad's brother who died and my dad took them uh, to his care. We were a big family, plus my dad and mom, so 18 people. Then as we were praying, dad, please, can you make it short? Can you just make it short? But no, dad will be praying. And not only will be praying, but he will be mentioning every single child. Now, I told you we were 16. Right, we were 16. And mentioning every child. And go, By the time he got to me, I was the ninth in my family. So by the time he got to me, I was snoring. It was, it was too late. Dad would take long to pray, long to pray. About an hour praying. I never really understood it. But when I grew up, then I understood the power of those prayers. Because most probably, I would not be the person I am today if he never prayed for me. Before even you see something in your life, someone should have been investing some prayer for you. Do you know that you could not even be saved if someone never prayed for your salvation? Nothing happened apart from prayer. Nothing. And nothing. And I remember before I go to my exams, every time I had ex exam, every time we had exam sessions and all that, from primary school to secondary school to university, I, I cannot remember a day where I, I was going to my exam and my mom let me go out of the house to do the exam without asking me to kneel down and lay her hands on me and pray for me for that exam. I can't remember it. God is my witness. Every time we had exam, mom would say, don't go yet until... When you're ready, you come. And when I'll come, I will kneel. There was a time where she was having a pain in the back. I will kneel down and she will lay hands on me and pray and pray and pray. Oh my God, I, I can't thank God enough for that. I did not know the importance of prayer at that time. My parents, they knew about it and they protected the children. They protected the family. They kept the family safe because of prayer. Because of prayer. And I remember as growing up that as in every family, there's always problems. There are problems everywhere. But one thing that really kept me, I keep thinking about it until now, is that no matter what has happened between mom and dad, when we have finished to pray as a family, when they go in the bedroom, you hear them too pray. That was just amazing. And, you know, that was a relationship, a marriage that lasted for a long time until my, my dad died. But when you ask someone, what is the secret for your marriage? What is the secret for your relationship? What is the secret for your family? It's not money. It's not beauty. It's not wealth. It's prayer. It's prayer. You can have all the money in the earth. Have you seen people who are poor getting rich and divorced because of money? Have you seen people who are okay? They were living. And sometimes we are in peace when there's no money. Everything is well. When we're managing that little, that, that, that little we manage. As soon as we get a bit more, then everyone gets his ambitions out. And that's why we cannot solve any, anything, any problem by ourselves. We need prayer. We need to sustain one another. We need to support one another. We need to come together and pray. When we're calling about prayer, my friend, you need to take it seriously. You need to take it seriously. Because I need your prayer just like Moses needed Aaron. You need my prayer. And we need to support one another. We need each other's prayer so that we can stand strong. You know, I thank God for the six, seven people who meet here every Wednesday evening for prayer. May God bless you all. But I have to say that if it wasn't for these six, seven people meeting up on Wednesdays to pray for the services, to pray for the church, who knows what could have happened. I thank God because as I've shown you how much prayer is the anchor and I respect, I honor people who pray. People who pray.
Your presence would not be possible in this place if someone did not come in this place and pray for you to turn up. Sometimes we take it for granted. We just think it just happened. No, it did not happen. God drew you. God called you. God invited you. You are here because God has, 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 has pulled you from somewhere. But someone had to pray for you. Someone has to go on his knees and cry out to God, Lord, we want to see so and so. We want to see so and so. And God has answered your presence in this place. It is the answer to someone's prayer. And your blessing will always be an answer to someone's prayer. God answers prayers. God hears prayers. God do amazing things through prayers. And I thank God for these children, for these kids who take the time to pray half an hour before we start the service. Every Sunday before we start the service, you don't have all these kids coming around and going in that next room just to pray. They lay the foundation, the spiritual foundation of the church. We will not have a great service unless all these people who join in prayer half an hour before the service and pray. It makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. If you are standing in prayer, if you pray for your church, if you pray for your pastor, if you pray for your family, if you pray for your children, you need to understand that you are doing the right thing. And a lot of things would not have, have happened if you never prayed. What prayer will do? Prayer changes us. It changes the ordinary man or woman and makes them extraordinary. Prayer changes us by drawing us closer to God. Prayer changes and mold our lives. But however, despite God's promise of the power of prayer to change us and to change the world, many Christians never tap into it. We come to Christ for salvation, but then we leave our Christian lives beneath the privileges that God has given us. It is, it is as if God prepared a huge a banquet for us and we are sitting in a corner with a sandwich. What I mean by this is God has said, I, I give you the power of prayer. You can do amazing things with prayer. You can change the word just with prayer. You can change your family just by prayer. You can change people around you just by the power of prayer. We know what prayer can bring, but yet we live beneath those privileges. We live below the standard because we don't want to tap into the power that God has given us. Who, whoever controls the spiritual realm, he controls the visible word. Should I say it again? Whoever controls the spiritual realm, he controls the visible word. Before you conquer the visible word, you conquer in the spiritual realm. Right. What, the example, I don't know if you're getting what I'm trying to say. Moses was praying, okay? Moses was lifting his hands up. It did not have anything to do with the battle on, on, on the ground. Joshua was fighting the battle. That was the real battle. That was the visible uh, battle. Moses was fighting another battle. That was the spiritual battle in the spiritual realm. And every time he was getting victory and he was, getting, uh, he was winning in the spiritual realm, Joshua on the ground was winning. So when you get control of your spiritual realm, you get control of your visible word. Before you convince anyone to do anything, make sure that you pray, you claim victory in the spiritual. Make sure you do that. I know there are people who may not believe in the spiritual word, but before we are visible human beings, we are first and foremost spiritual human beings. Everything that happened in the visible, it has, it has happened in the spiritual. And the other way you have to see it is, 
whatever you see around the design before it, before you see them it was planned in the mind you don't start anything without having it in your mind the tv someone conceived it in the mind so before we start, we begin to start to, to, to see things in our lives. We need to be claiming that in the realm. We need to be praying. We need to be asking God for victory. We need to be asking God for power. We need to be asking God. The Bible tells us that the first church, the disciples, they prayed for 10 days. For 10 days they prayed. In the book of Acts chapter 1 and 2 and 3. They prayed for 10 days. And after 10 days the Bible says. The apostle Peter went out to preach for 3 minutes. And in 3 minutes the Bible says. 3,000 people they believe in Jesus. 10 days of prayer. 3 minutes. 3 minutes of preaching. Look at the result. But what we do is. We speak 10 minutes and we pray 3 minutes. We did the other way around. We do microwave prayers. Microwave prayers. And because we live in this generation where we want fast food, we need everything to be done quickly. You know, even when we are in the church, have you gone to services that took just 40 minutes, 45 minutes, because people are like, we want to go home. We want to go home. I want you to finish. We are in a generation of people who rush, who rush, who rush, who want to do things quickly. They microwave your generation. Even now our prayer, they start just becoming just like who we are. We just go two minutes in prayer, three minutes in prayer. But then we've got a lot of things that we have to do. But as I said, if you can win the battle in the spiritual realm, you can't even fight the battle because you've already won the battle. Before you fight the battle, you've already won the battle. You've already won the battle. And that's why there is a saying in sport that whoever is bleeding in the training will not even sweat in the game. If you're bleeding in the training, you can't even sweat because you've done the, the hardest thing. And the battle really is nothing. If you can pray and pray and pray for your family, for your loved one, for your church, you've won the battle before even you see the battle because God has given you the battle in the spiritual and you will see it in real. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. The Bible says, Now to him who is able to, to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in, in who? Hello, church. According to the power that works in, in us. Oh. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask, in other words, God is able to do above, exceedingly above what we have prayed for, what we have asked in our prayer, according to the power that works in us. God has given us the power. God has put the power in us. The power to change our surroundings. The power to change our families, the power to impact other people, to impact our children. And that is the power that we don't usually use. If we can only begin to use that power in prayer and investing time in prayer. I'm talking about investing time in prayer. The time that you spend in the prayer is an investment that you've just made. You've just invested in something. And you will see the result very soon. You will see the result very soon. And this is what the Bible tells us. I'll give you five prayer requests. Before I finish, five prayer requests that we need to do when we are praying. And according to John chapter 17, 8 to 24, the first thing we need to pray, we need to pray that God, we will sense the glory of God. We will sense the glory of God. We found this 
in John chapter 17, in verse 22. In verse 22, the Bible says, this is Jesus' prayer. Jesus said, and the glory which you gave me, I have given, I have given them. In other words, Jesus is, is saying to the Father, Father, the same glory you gave me, I want your people to see the same glory. That is, the, that is God's will, for you to see the, the glory of God, to see the power of God. And let me tell you this, the word glory in Greek means the visible manifestation of the splendor, power, and the radiance of God. So when Jesus said that, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, what God wants to see, God wants to see your life, your family, your church begin to reflect the visible manifestation of God's splendor, of God's majesty, of God's beauty. And this is what God wants you to experience. To experience that beauty, that power, that glorious power in our lives. Through prayer. Through prayer. And that means that every time we pray, we have to go before God and say, Lord, we want to see your glory in our homes. We want to see your glory. In other words, the visible manifestation of your presence in our homes, in our families, in our church. Lord, we want to see that. We want to see that. Lord, we want to see the visible manifestation of your presence on our children. On our children. Wherever they go. Wherever they go. You know, one day when I was a young man, uh, probably I was probably 16 or, or 15. In the area where I was living, there was a lot of jujus. But the jujus, I think you know what I'm talking about, jujus, yeah? Do you know what juju is? It's, a, it's kind of magic, yeah? And uh, young people, all the young people would go and get these things, but most of us, we were getting it for fight. Because at that age, we, there were gangs that we had to fight each other. The problem is if you do not have a bit of it, we were, you felt like vulnerable. You felt like vulnerable. And everyone had to, had to, had to get it. You know, you get it. And while young people would go, we would, we would, we would say, you know, a magician, and they will do kind of, um, they will put some wounds here, a bit of blood, you're coming out, and they would take some of powder and putting it in the wounds, and they would do some kind of incantation and prayers. They would make you smoke tobacco, uh, a strong, strong, really strong tobacco. They would make you smoke it and invoke a spirit. And as they start invoking spirit, you start feeling something moving in you. And that what most of my friends, they told me. The problem is this. Now, I felt like I was vulnerable for not getting into this. Because everyone had it. And I made a decision to find someone who would connect me with the person who can give me exactly the same thing. And I went to that person, we spoke, and he told me what I have to bring. He told me exactly what I have to bring. And I managed to bring all these things. And as soon as we sat down, the guy started the tobacco and gave me the tobacco and said that you're going to start this. As soon as, we, as soon as we were just about to begin, he told me, stop. And I said, why? I said, no, 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 I can't do this. I can't, no, 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 I can't do this. It's just like he got very uncomfortable that he said, I can't do this, I can't do this. No, no, stand up, stand up, stand up. I can't do this. Stop, stop, stop. Then he asked me to go out. I went out, disappointed. I couldn't understand why all my friends will have this. It was just normal for everyone. But why I can't have this? Then I was going home, disappointed. As soon as I got home, my mom was waiting for me and my big brother was waiting for me. And as soon as I come, it, it looks suspicious, really suspicious. But I just went in, into the house and my mom called me and I went into the house and um, they asked me, where have you been? I wanted to lie. I didn't want to tell them where I, I, I went because I knew it, they wouldn't like it. But one of my friends told my mom that Charlie is going to get that. And my mom began to pray. 
Please God, I don't want him to get into this. Please God, I don't want him to get this. And as she was praying, I was just about to get into this. And this man got so uncomfortable that he asked me to go out and I never touched it. Prayer is it's just amazing. My mom did not have the power physically to come and get me. But she had the power that she could use inside her and the power of prayer. Wow. The power of prayer. You have no power to change people around you. Yes, but you have the power inside you. Oh, it's just like a remote control. A remote control. Prayer is just like a remote control. We can control people and control things in their spiritual realm without touching them. What a power. What a power. I just wish that all of us would understand about this and use the power that God has given us. Use the power that God has given us. I hear people talking about, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. But before you do that, you need to go on your knees and you need to win that battle on your knees. Sometimes having meetings is good, but it's better when we pray. Most of the time we want to sit down and let talk through our stuff. Let talk through our issues. Have you seen people who have been talking about the issues over and over again, but they never change? We talked about it. It seems like a week has gone by. Everything was okay. Then the second week has come back. It has come back. We told our children about what they should do. It seems that they've heard. Then after a time, they get back to what they used to do. You've been arguing with your partner for years about exactly the same thing. Talking about it, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And sometimes we have to stop talking about it. We need to start praying about it. And praying about it seriously. Think, you know, praying about it as if you know that this is the weapon that God has given me to control the situation, to take to take over the situation. I will use what Moses used so that I can, we can win this battle. And the Bible tells us that as Moses kept his hands up, the Bible says Israel was able to defeat, to defeat the Amalekai. They did not, Joshua did not defeat the Amalekai because of the weapon, because of a, a military strategy. Most of the time we read books, we read magazines on how to take care of this, how to take care of this. My friend, I want to tell you, God has given you a simple solution for whatever you want to get, prayer. Prayer. Prayer changes. Prayer molds people. He molds things. Prayer affects people. Prayer affects people. My friend, I just feel like telling you some of the story just to show you how much it's amazing uh, prayer. Uh, there was a woman who lost her husband because of another woman. The husband left the, the, left the wife because of another woman. But the problem is the woman who was left uh, by the man, she was a warrior in prayer. The Bible says, uh, the testimony goes that that woman began to pray. She did not want to go and fight. She didn't want to go and make noise. She didn't want to go and do anything. She began to pray. Praying for the man, not cursing for the man, uh, you know, cursing the man. But the specific prayer is that she, she was claiming her husband from God. I say, Lord, this is mine. You have given me my husband. Lord, I'm claiming him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It looked like nothing was happening for some times until one day a knock was at the door at the man with the luggages walking as if he was being drawn by a magnet. He was just walking and knocked at the door and the woman opened the door and he went like, is that you? It's me, I'm coming home. Are you coming home? Okay, my darling, just go and put your stuff back where they, they used to be. As she said, I never went out to fight with anyone. I just put my, 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 my knees down and pray and pray and pray. 
How many things we can control in this life? Not a lot. You can't control what I do at work. You cannot control what your wife does, where she goes. You can't control your husband about what he does at work, wherever he goes. You can't control what they see. You can't control how they react to things. But God says, I have given you the power to control everything. I've given you the remote control where you can go on your knees and claim for your children, claim victory for your children, claim protection over your children, claim that their lives will succeed, that God will glorify himself in their lives and that will happen in the lives of your children. Someone who, <laughs> hallelujah, someone who has prayed for his children over the course of their lives cannot lose. I hope we do not scare him. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Hallelujah. Someone who has prayed for his children, someone who's prayed for his family over the course of their lives, they cannot lose the battle. My friend, would you join in and become a warrior in prayer? Would you make it a habit? Would you make it your priority not to miss a prayer? Would you make it, um, would you make it a habit in your family to gather around your house and pray. It doesn't matter how old your children are, big or small, but would you just gather around and say, guys, we're going to pray. We're just going to ask for God for his hands, for his touch, for his glory, for his blessing, for peace, for breakthrough, for success. Having talent is all good, but you still need the grace of God. Having strength is good, but you still need the grace of God. Would you make it, would you make it a priority in your house? Would you make it a priority in the church when we have prayer meetings on Wednesdays? Would you just say to yourself, I'm joining the army? Would you make it a priority on Sunday instead of coming at one o'clock? Why not come at 12.30 and join in an army of prayer people, people who are impacting the life of others just by praying? Would you make it a priority? Would you be one of them? Would you be one of the members of your family who is impacting the lives of everyone in your family because you pray for each and every one of them? Can we bow our head? Oh, come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see what the Lord has done. He has done so much good.